Uh, So we're in the book of Judges once more, and last time we made it to chapter 6, and I think we made it down to verse... Oh boy, I think we made it close to verse 14. Oh yeah, we did, because we had that conversation about Lord. Um, Yes, we made it to, to verse 16, so... I'm variously using my translations. I think I have the NIV and the King James today. Uh, Whatever translation, again, you're using is fine. Uh, But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we look at the life of Gideon today in the book of Judges, we pray for your blessing. Open our eyes by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we might see their lessons for our lives and our faith. Help us always supremely to grow in this Christian faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, So Judges, just a little bit of a reminder from last time. Uh, Judges 6, we had uh, Gideon, and he was greeted as mighty man of valor. Uh, And we remember that this is pretty comedic because Gideon is fearfully uh, grinding out the the weed in the the wine press there. uh, And he looks anything but brave. Uh, And we talked about last week a little bit about why exactly did God call him mighty man of valor? Was it just for, you know, the irony? Is it just to point out his uh, cowardice in kind of a funny way? Uh, Or was it prophetic? Was God speaking uh, Gideon's future to him that he would become a mighty man of valor? That even though he was afraid, even though he was weak, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he would become strong. He would become brave. Uh, That's an interesting question for us today. Uh, I would suggest the second, because we are going to see that Gideon, uh, even though he's he's weak, God keeps using him and keeps growing him. Uh, We talked a little bit about uh, who Gideon thinks this is and whether uh, he thinks this is an angel uh, or whether this is the Lord uh, speaking to him directly um, in the sense of it's it's a Christophany, it's an appearance of Christ before the incarnation. And we, we kind of had our, our, our discussion both ways on that. Um, so we're uh, finished verse 16. Uh, we get the call. Uh, the Lord says, I will be with you and we'll strike down all the Midianites together. Uh, and verse 17 uh, and 18 here, let's read. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. All right. Uh, And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Okay, so Gideon uh, is asking for a sign. Uh, Why do you think this is? Why do you think Gideon's doing this? Well, if I had somebody talking to me that I didn't know, I'd want to know a little more about that person. Yeah, rightly so, right? Reassurance, Reassurance, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's interesting too. He asks for a sign, and it's one of those things that does happen in the Bible frequently. And so, um, in the Bible, when God appears to Moses at the burning bush, uh, he speaks to him, and he gives him this dramatic sign of the bush um, on fire, but not being consumed by the fire. And then later, he gives uh, Moses the different signs. Right? He gives him the signs of. Uh, the serpent turning into the staff. He gives him uh, the sign of the leprous hand being healed and then the the water turning to blood. So God does have a history when he sends people out to act in his name that he does give them signs. Uh, Just recently at Pentecost, we celebrated in the church. Um, God sends out the church with the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He sends out signs and wonders, right? They're able to speak in tongues. They're able to communicate the mighty works of God in other languages. Uh, And so... In one sense, it's not illegitimate. It's not outright wrong for Gideon to ask for a sign. Um, And you might be tempted if an angel shows up at your doorstep to ask for a sign because uh, we might be thinking, oh, I'm having some kind of uh, episode uh, and I need some proof that this this is real, right? And yet at the other hand, you could say, well, I think the angel appearing out of nowhere Uh, and delivering God's word to him was sign enough for Gideon, and he should have been satisfied. And I think you're you're right on on both counts if you were to say those things, um, because the Bible teaches us that signs don't actually produce faith. That's the strange thing, because we think as humans, well, of course, if we just saw it once, then we'd believe, then we'd have no problem, right? 
And it's interesting, the generation that left Egypt, that walked through the Red Sea, did they believe that God could lead them safely into the promised land? No. They'd seen every sign imaginable. They'd seen God, you know, have water come from the rock. They'd seen all these sorts of miracles, and the signs never actually produce faith. We always have some human capacity to doubt, to say, well, maybe that's not really the case or not really what happened. Or maybe, you know, we just haven't figured out what the trick is. So humans are always asking for signs. And again, sometimes in the Bible, they're given signs. Um, but one of the things we're see, we see again and again is that signs don't really ever produce faith. They might kind of temporarily confirm faith, but they never really produce faith. And so I want you to watch uh, Gideon's faith as we go through this account of him asking for signs. Verse 19, Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When, a, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Um, Verse 23, but the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. All right, so Gideon, so a lot of things happen here right now. So first of all, Gideon prepares a meal and he brings it to him uh, by the oak tree. And this should be reminding all of us uh, biblical scholars, oh, the last time, you know, we, we had this oak tree motif. Uh, we had, uh, maybe not the last time, but one of the, the prominent times of the oak tree motif, we had uh, Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre eating with uh, God, eating with the three uh, visitors, the three angels. Again, that, that term is used to describe them. Um, so Gideon is, is probably imagining, well, I'm going to eat a meal just like Abraham ate with uh, God then. Uh, but it's a little different. He says, you know, this food that you just prepared, pour it out on the rock. And then he just blows it up, right? He, he makes it burst into flames. Something that probably... Um, you know, desert rocks are hot, but they're not going to cause combustion. They're not going to make uh, food burst into flames. Uh, and so here we go. Here's his sign from God. Uh, so he gets his, his sign from God. And how does Gideon respond? In faith, right? He, he, or maybe by sight, he responds and says, Sovereign Lord. And then he says that he's seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So he realizes this was a big deal. This wasn't just something in my head. This is, this is real. Um, and God even gives him an additional promise, right? Uh, and this is interesting. This is, this is more fuel for the, uh, the angel side of the argument here because the angel disappears. Um, and then it says in verse 23, but the Lord said to him. So maybe God was speaking uh, separately to him. Uh, the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. Uh, you are not going to die. All right, so we have God answering the unspoken fears of Gideon, right? So, so God shows up and God speaks to Gideon. And Gideon's initial complaint to God is, well, if, if you're a good God, then why are all these bad things happening to our people, right? It's, it's a more generalized concern. He has philosophical problems with God, as many people would. But what happens is the angel cuts to the heart. He knows Gideon is just afraid to die. It's just that simple, right? He doesn't want to die. Uh, and so he gives him that promise that you're not going to die. Um, and so that should comfort Gideon. That should be the strength that he needs uh, to go out and to fight. But we're going to see that the sign doesn't work the way that Gideon might think that it's going to work. Is he fearful of dying in battle or is he fearful of dying because he saw the face of an angel? Oh, that's an interesting point, too. Uh, I always read it as he, he was afraid because uh, he's going to die in battle. But you're right. It might be that uh, he was afraid because he just said, I've seen, you know, the Lord. Like, I've, I've seen something I wasn't supposed to see, right? I've, I've peeked behind the curtain. 
um, and so I'm going to die. And maybe that's his thought. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And even when God shows uh, Moses his glory, right, he has to kind of shield it, him because uh, you're not, you can't look at God and, and live. So again, so then we have on the other hand, more argument that uh, it is a Christophany. So I don't know. Um, it is interesting though that God speaks to him and uh, humans, this is this constant relationship we have with God. Humans are doubting and they're fearful. And what does God always say to them? Peace, do not be afraid. I, I love the, there's scholarship. I haven't looked up every individual one, but there's, uh, it's quoted quite often that if you count up the amount of times uh, God says, fear not, or do not be afraid in the Bible, it's 366 times. So someone said, you even get one for a leap year, right? You can take every day of the year uh, and read that command of God, do not be afraid, because we're fearful people, right? We, we, we doubt, we're uncertain, we can't see everything, uh, and so we're not sure. So he tells him he's not going to die. And that's a, that's a, a great uh, interpretation there. He might just be afraid because he saw an angel. Verse 24, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites, uh, obviously when this was written. Um, and so he, he declares God is peace. Now, peace is one of these concepts that we struggle with and we want in our daily lives. And peace was actually sought after so desperately by people in the ancient world, uh, the irony in Greek, uh, a few uh, centuries after this is happening, that the Greeks would actually erect uh, altars and temples to Irene, to peace, uh, as a, a representative goddess, because they were just so desperate for peace. There was so much uncertainty in a world of constant wars and, you know, no antibiotics and food scarcity and all of the the things that they're dealing with in, in those days. Uh, and so they want peace. And so it's interesting that God proclaims peace. But usually when God proclaims peace, it's in a situation where you have every earthly reason to be afraid, right? If you think of the moment right now, what has happened to Gideon? Well, he's seen God create an explosion in front of him and he's being told that he has to go to battle. And what does God speak to him? Peace. <laughs> Relax, uh, be calm, be at ease. Uh, I'm with you. It's the same when Jesus appears uh, walking on the sea and the disciples think that they're seeing a ghost, right? And what does Jesus say to them? Peace. Uh, well, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. I can't understand. I'm in the middle of a dangerous storm. I have no earthly reason to have any peace. Uh, but God can look out over circumstances uh, and assure us that you know there will be peace, that it will be all right. All right, so he uh, sets up an altar, uh, a place of worship, uh, and then he, he names it the Lord as peace so that others can know too. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bowl as an, a burnt offering. All right, so what is Gideon commanded to do and why might this be a problem? Yeah, we remember Baal is the god of the Canaanites. So God picks Gideon. Is Gideon from a good believing family that is faithful to Yahweh? His father was Caleb? No. His father built the altar. Yeah, his father built the altar. Yeah, he's not Caleb. Um, Caleb uh, probably is dead by this point. But um, his father built the altar, right? So the idea. Pardon? What was his father's name? Very good question. I don't know off of my. Uh, I believe. Oh, it's Joash. There we go. Sorry. Keeping me on my toes. Joash. Um, kind of like Josh. Uh, so 
Basically, he gets the command, hey, you know that place where your dad worships, where your dad goes to seek the blessings of the false gods of all the nations around us? That place where, you know, when he gets upset or he's worried or he doesn't think the crops are going to come, uh, he puts, you know, the important offerings on it. Go to his most sacred place and tear that down with his own property, with one of his bulls, right? And then do what with the second bull? Sacrifice it, right? So this would be like if his dad had a, a beautiful statue or something that he spent all of his money on and he said, you know, take one of your dad's cars and ram it into the statue at full speed and then, you know, take the other car and just give it away to someone else, right? Like this is taking all of the stuff that your dad treasures, the stuff that your dad values um, and basically get rid of it, destroy it. This is the scariest thing, right? You know, he has to confront his father, basically, his father's sins uh, in an era when you wouldn't do that. You would never uh, uncover your father's sins or your father's embarrassment, right? Uh, and he's called to do this because the idea is repentance is going to bring begin at home, right? If Gideon goes out and says, you know, you always called me to this or that, his friends are probably likely to say, Yahweh, doesn't your dad worship Baal? Doesn't he have that big statue, that, that Asherah pole to that other god, uh, goddess? Uh, I thought that's who you guys learned about. I thought you went to Baal VBS in the summer. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the reaction, right? And, and that's what happens sometimes um, when someone is zealous or someone invites uh, someone to church or they try to do the right thing. The first thing back you usually hear is, oh, you're a hypocrite because I know about this or that sin of yours. Or I remember, you know, seeing you out partying pretty hard the other day and now you're telling me this? Uh, that's the instinctive response people have. And so where is God telling Gideon to clean up first? His own family, right? His own home. Get your own house set in order before you go out to lead others. Uh, this is a principle that exists all throughout the Bible. Um, if you look at the requirements for pastors, there are requirements the pastors have to meet, but actually the majority of the pastor's requirements have to do with their wives and their children. Uh, they have to be uh, how they deal with their household, right? Um, and so the idea is if you don't have your household in order, then don't go out and tell other people uh, how to live their lives, even if what you're saying is coming from God's word. Um, and I think we've We've definitely lost that quite a bit in the church nowadays. We tend to think that being a pastor is just about having an advanced theology degree or knowing Greek or Hebrew. Uh, and that alone does not qualify uh, a person to be a pastor. Just like Gideon, you know, he might have been a, a tough guy. He might have been able to wave a sword, uh, but he had to clean up house first. Uh, and so this is his first test. Uh, can he be brave enough to do this? All right, uh, Gideon, uh, verse 27. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. You can't have 10 people in on a scheme like that and not have it go out, right? Um, so basically, he, even his scheme of trying to do it in the middle of the night, pointless, didn't really buy him much time. Uh, verse 30, the men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. All right, so these are like the sacred images of worship that other people would go to too. Uh, and by doing this, Gideon has basically set up a foothold. He said, uh, we are not worshiping the gods that our neighbors are worshiping anymore. We're not doing that anymore. We're doing something differently. And how does the town react? We're going to kill your boy, right? You, you better bring him uh, down because he has, he's made a bad choice. And, you know, Gideon probably doesn't know at this moment what his dad's going to do. But this sort of thing happens uh, all the time. Uh, and sometimes it happens even when we're uh, trying to do the right thing. Family 
uh, strife exists like this. I remember um, when I was leaving the church of my parents, before I told them that I was leaving their church, I went and asked your dad, if I get thrown out of the house tonight, can I sleep on your couch? Uh, and we weren't even dating at the time. But the idea was, you know, I thought, yeah, Sarah was dating someone else. Um, <laughs> So he did. My father is, is, uh, was, was very gracious and, and uh, loving through all of that, but I was scared, right? And it was one of those things where I thought, oh boy, I've crossed a line uh, in the community here. It's going to affect other people, right? Uh, and this happens in, in our world as well too, right? There are kids who, who leave or they'll, they'll join another church or they'll join no church uh, and, and you know we won't see them. And this will be an issue not just for us, but for grandkids and for other family members and other people. Uh, who see our faith has a bigger impact than just us, even if we're trying our best to kind of hide it or keep it a secret. It's just going to to, to come out in all sorts of ways. And that's a good thing. That's how the world uh, sees the light of Christ. And so Gideon is doing what God tells him to, but now his dad is in trouble. And let's see how his dad responds. Verse 31, but Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day they called Gideon Jerob Baal, saying, Let Baal contend with him, because he broke down Baal's altar. All right, so his dad makes a really interesting argument. His dad actually comes to his defense and to, to his dad's credit, his dad knows that he's not supposed to be worshiping Baal, right? Um, it's sort of like if Gideon would have gone and, you know, taken his stash of, uh, you know, uh, illegal drugs or, or playboys or something and gotten rid of them and burned them, right? He's not going to go out publicly and say, hey, give me back that thing that I shouldn't have had in the first place. He has a little bit of sense. He has a little bit of, of decency here. Uh, and so he says, all right, uh, you know what, uh, if he's really going to offend Baal, then let's see what Baal's going to do to him. And now Gideon went from, you know, preaching a sermon to being a sermon, right? Because everyone's going to be watching Gideon that day. <laughs> you know, if, if Gideon gets struck by lightning that day, everyone's going to know, oh, yeah, that's what happens when you contend with Baal, right? I imagine there was a lot of people very interested in Gideon's health and welfare the next few days uh, after he broke down that altar uh, and set up the altar to Yahweh. Uh, and I think it's interesting, too, because Joash shows the level of interest most people have about religion. Uh, he says, you know, are you really going to fight about this? Do you really care that much? And that's the interesting thing. It seems like the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's about how interested people really are in religion. Uh, they're not actually going to, like, shed blood over it most of the time. It's just sort of, hey, that's offensive to me. Uh, well, are you going to do anything about it? Well, no. Um, and so that's the level of devotion they have to Baal. So they're worshiping Baal and Asherah, but they're not really devoted worshipers, right? They're not diehards uh, for, for these gods and goddesses. They're, they're just going to kind of wait it out and see what happens. Uh, and so what good comes out of this? Well, number one, people can't have the false worship anymore. They can't worship Baal anymore at this altar. Number two, Gideon has taken a stand, and now everyone in the community knows uh, that Gideon has taken a stand, right? Um, because he has a nickname now, uh, Jerob Baal, which means let Baal contend or let Baal sort him out, right? And so as long as Gideon lives, every day he's alive, it's basically an insult to the false god Baal, right? Baal can't even take out Gideon. And remember, how, how strong does Gideon rate himself? He says he's the lowest of the low, right? He's the weakest member of the weakest clan of Israel. So you'd think if Baal was a real God, you'd think if, you know, he was, he was a tough guy, someone worth worshiping or offering sacrifices to, Gideon would be pretty easy to take out, right? Gideon isn't a Goliath. He's just a nobody. He's just an ordinary kid, basically. Um, and so that's the other good thing that people have now learned. Oh, this false God is pointless. Uh, and then thirdly, now Gideon has a reputation as a leader. He's someone who's actually stood up and done something uh, that's right. I think it's interesting uh, listening to the commentators talk about um, playoff hockey. 
uh, we were watching this year. And one of the things they said with, uh, you know, the Leafs and the Panthers, uh, they said, well, in playoff hockey, you just have to scare the guys, right? You have to be a little tougher than you ordinarily would be. They don't call enough. They don't call as many penalties. And the idea is you're not necessarily getting any tactical advantage at a moment. You're just rougher so that people start to realize, oh, I have to, you know, be afraid. I have to be on the defensive. And I think that's what Gideon has done now by knocking down the altar of Baal. He's done that first check. And now uh, people are going to start taking notice. All right, uh, let's see what happens. Verse 33. Now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what ha happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. All right, a fair amount of stuff has just happened. First of all, uh, in response... The Midianites are going to do something to uh, Gideon, right? They've, they've joined together uh, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other Eastern people. So the really rotten ones, the Amalekites are, are pretty much like the worst of the... I don't think we meet a group of people worse than the Amalekites in, in the Old Testament. Um, so kind of like the worst of the worst assemble, and they meet in the Valley of Jezreel. Now, I'm not an ancient Near Eastern geographer, but from the research I did... Uh, this valley uh, is near that uh, Megiddo, near the Valley of Armageddon, right? This is where like the final battle is portrayed in the Bible. So uh, there's this cosmic sense again that the Bible is giving that this is what always happens. God's people stand up, the enemies of God's people stand together uh, and they fight, right? And there's always these climactic battles. There's always these moments of challenge uh, and God's side always looks like it's going to do worse than the devil's side. Uh, the devil's side always has numbers. They always have the best technology. They always have the most impressive PR. God's side always looks pretty weak. So all these nations come together, and they're going to teach him a lesson. And Gideon, it says, I love this, verse 34, the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and then he did something, right? And then he... He blew a trumpet again. And that's that third article lesson that we get from the small catechism. Who is the one moving in us when we are doing the right thing? The Spirit of God. God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who works in us. Uh, and, and we are the glove and he is the hand, right? Um, uh, he is the one uh, doing the heavy lifting. So Gideon summons uh, people. And then we get these Abiezrites again. Uh, so these other people uh, who theoretically should be bad guys, right? Um, but sometimes, uh, and this might be a, a smaller group like the Kenites or something like that. Again, I apologize. I don't know uh, all about the Abiezrites, but they, they come along too. Uh, and then we get Manasseh showing up. We get Zebulun. We get Naphtali uh, showing up. So, so they are showing up. Asher is there. Uh, so some of the tribes are, are faithful. Some of them are going to fight uh, the Midianites. It's been seven years of oppression, and they're ready uh, to take back their country, Right. Uh, and so then Gideon speaks to God. And what does Gideon ask God for? Sign. A sign. Another one, right? And it's funny because as a human, you can understand this, right? Well, I'm going from a human, from the perspective of a human sinner, this seems natural, right? We're like, well, of course he asked for a sign. Uh, uh, we, we don't trust in God, right? We want, we want assurances everywhere, right? What do humans do when they do business to each other? Or with each other, they sign contracts, right? And what do those contracts say? You're bound, and if you don't do it, then you're going to have this. They're going to take your money, or they're going to put you in jail, or they're going to do this. Humans never just kind of shake hands and say, oh, it'll be fine, right? We're not trusting people. We are doubtful, doubtful people. But from God's perspective, this must almost look comedic, right? What are you talking about? You need a sign? I already, 
I did the sign. I showed up. I, I lit the stuff on fire. I filled you with the Holy Spirit. You summoned all these armies. What sign are you talking about? And, and now a fleece is going to prove it? It's kind of silly, but this is how we are as humans. So Gideon asks for the sign. And he asks for the fleece to be wet. How do you assess this? Do you think this is a good sign, bad sign? Do you relate to Gideon? I always thought this was a bad sign. Have you ever He's left asking. something outside? He's asking God what he wants. Yeah, yeah. Instead of God giving him yeah. Instead of giving him what kind of sign he wants to give him, where it's these are reversing. Yeah, who's He's in reversed, charge? He's reversing yeah. the whole situation. Yeah, you're right. Who's in charge here, right? Gideon is trying to make God do his business. And then practically, I just think it's a bad sign. If you ever leave something out at night, it will be wet with dew, and it will probably feel more wet than the grass around it. Um, so not even a particularly great sign, although we do read the ground uh, was dry around it. And I think Gideon realizes that it's not a great sign, because look what he does next. Then Gideon said to God, verse 39, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. All right, so now he's had three signs from God, right? He's had as many signs as, as you know you could want to prove uh, that God is real and that God is with him. Um, I probably would have asked for iron chariots, um, but Gideon, you know, he has his own thing to, to sort out, right? Um, so Gideon leaves these fleece out, and this then becomes a language piece of the Christian faith for, you know, thousands of years after this. It's the question, did what Gideon ask for, was that right of him to ask for it? Was it okay? Was it a sin? It's human, absolutely. I guess when we pray, we always ask for something. Yeah, yeah. So in one sense, you can say, well, no, Gideon didn't do anything wrong. He just prayed. God could have told him, no, I've already given you a sign. And that could have been that, right? And he could have gone forward. Um, so in one sense, uh, there's nothing wrong to, to pray. Uh, we're, we're commanded to pray. Um, I will go to people's hospital beds. And sometimes, you know, they're young and healthy and they're, uh, in there for, for next to nothing, and we'll pray that they get well. And other times, people say, you know, they're, they're terminal, and we still pray uh, for them to get well. And, and sometimes other people pray, you know, Pastor, don't, don't even ask God to, to heal me. I'm ready to go. And that happens sometimes too. Um, we're in different situations. Sometimes we want to ask. Sometimes we don't want to ask um, based on, on where we are. Um, Martin Luther, in his own life, I think it's curious uh, he went through all sorts of difficulties. And there's uh, moments where you see him doing both. Uh, there's a big moment where um, pretty early in the Reformation, uh, Philip Melanchthon, his right-hand man, the guy who wrote most of the Lutheran confessions, uh, Phil, he gets really sick, uh, sick to the point that he's about to die. Uh, and so Luther goes and makes this dramatic prayer that Philip Melanchthon will be healed, that he'll get better. And he basically prays to God, God, I can't do this Reformation thing without Philip Melanchthon, so you better heal him now. And he says that uh, he went to God uh, with his sack empty and threw it at his doorstep. And it always reminds me of trick-or-treating. That notion of like, if, if you went to a house and they said, sorry, we're out of candy, and the kid just threw down the sack and said, you will fill this with something uh, before I leave, right? That's the type of prayer uh, that he did uh, for Philip Melanchthon in that moment because he really felt uh, that was that. Now there's another point much, much later in Luther's life uh, where his daughter, who I think is nine years old, Magdalena, uh, is at the point of death. Uh, and he's there at her bedside and he's praying for her. Uh, and he basically uh, prays God, if, if, you, if this is her time for you to take her, uh, then, you know, I, I yield her into your hand. Uh, and, and the point of that story is not, well, man, he really liked Philip a lot more than his daughter. No, 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 that's not the point. The point is that uh, at different times, we ask different things of God, and our faith also gets to the point 
where maybe we get to the point where we start to trust God and we start to realize, you know what, God, your plan might be better than my plan. You might actually understand things better than I understand them. So it's not that our faith gets weaker, but sometimes as our faith gets stronger, we ask for less. We, we can do uh, with less and less. Uh, it, it's one of those mysteries. But I don't think Gideon is, he's never condemned outright for asking for a sign, but we do see that it fits into his human uh, character, right? He's someone who's afraid. Uh, he's someone who's fearful. And I think the encouraging thing for us is that God is so gracious to us because of Christ that we can even ask for signs. We can even pray uh, for whatever we ask uh, and, and God will hear our prayers. Uh, and so that's good news for us. And so God accepts Gideon and he, he sticks with Gideon, even though Gideon keeps asking for sign after sign. Chapter seven, early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. And the camp, the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. All right, so what is God saying at the beginning of on the, the battle day? What's his complaint? Too many, people. too many people. This is going to be too easy. All right. Uh, so the numbers here, I'm trying to remember if it's broken down in these verses or a bit later. I don't know how I know this, but I know that there was about 135,000 uh, on the enemy side, and Gideon had 32,000. Uh, so God says 32,000, that's too many. Um, you, you need to say anyone who's afraid can leave. Well, this is an interesting command. Uh, if we jump back into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, into the law of God, it perfectly matches with the law of God. Uh, Deuteronomy 20 verse 2 says, uh, when you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Uh, and then the officers ask these questions, verse 5. Uh, the officers shall say to the army, has anyone built a new house and not dedicated him? Let him go home, or he may die in battle, and someone else may dedicate it. Has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home, or he may die in battle, and someone else enjoy it. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, or he may die in battle, and someone else marry her. Then the officers shall add, is any man afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home, so that his brothers will not become disheartened too. All right, so that's a lot of ways to get out of fighting, right? Uh, first of all, you know, if, if you planted a vineyard, you haven't tasted any of the grapes yet, go home and enjoy it. If you know, you're building a house, go home and enjoy it. If you just got married, go home and enjoy it. And then the last one is, if you're afraid, go. And why? So the rest of the... Get yeah, so that others don't get discouraged, right? There is a motto in the uh, English military in, in World War I, and the, the motto of the infantry was, look to the man in front. And the idea was, you always are commanded to look to the man in front. Why? Because if you look back, people might think they're sounding the retreat, right? They're, gonna, they're heading in the wrong direction. So the idea is, you only look forward in battle. You only look to the front. Um, there's armies throughout history that have made armor for their soldiers, and the armor is only on the front. They don't put it on the back because they don't want to save the guys who are running away, who are, are fleeing from a battle. This was absolutely a problem in the ancient world. Uh, there are so many accounts I could tell you of in European history where a battle begins 
and like two minutes into the battle, more than half of both sides have already fled in retreat. It was to the point where it was hard to even pitch a battle uh, because people would flee so often. And so the idea is, of these 32,000, how many are afraid and wanting to run away already? 22,000, right? It says, um, and so it's one of those things where you can imagine the psychological effect of, imagine your army is going, and two-thirds of the soldiers start running away in panic. What do you think the other soldiers are going to do? <laughs> Join in, right? It's one of those things where we're kind of herd animals. We'll, we'll just follow wherever it else is. So Gideon just sends them away. He just says, go. They, they, they think that's what has happened in Russia, too, is a lot of the Russian soldiers have uh, jumped ship. Yeah, yeah. They were showing videos of them deserting and stuff like that. And I think that was the idea was to show it so that if the Russians see, oh, our own soldiers are deserting, uh, there's, there's not really much hope then for your side, right? That's why the Romans killed deserters. Um, but the, the Israelites weren't as organized back then. Um, and God makes this provision. If they're afraid, they don't have to fight. Uh, verse four, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths, all the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tent, tents, but kept the 300, who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. All right. I don't, I'm curious if you can think about why God might have chosen these ones over the other ones. I've heard a lot of wild explanations in the last week as I read through this, and I don't think it's, I don't think there's any logic to it, uh, but I'll give you what the commentators say swiftly. Um, some people said uh, that the ones who, who lapped like dogs, uh, they were in a position of putting their hands to their mouths, and so they were staying on their feet, uh, which made them more like prepared for battle uh, than the other ones who just, you know, started drinking. I don't think there's any sense to it than that. Um, that's that seems far fetched to me. But again, I've never uh, had a battle in the Bronze Age, so I don't know what they're looking for. God, I've already chosen the ones who just want to go to battle. Exactly right, and I think the other thing is if this showed that these men were somehow smarter or better than the rest of them, then why did God choose Gideon, who was like the weakest and the least equipped to, to lead them? Right? Uh, it seems like God is choosing the most inept people constantly uh, to to fight on His behalf. The only quality He ever seems to be looking for is faith. Is do you trust or not? Uh, do you believe or not? And if you have faith, then God can move mountains with you. Um, and so how many soldiers does Gideon get now? 300. 300. Okay, so there are times in battle where, in history, where a smaller group has defeated, you know, a, a larger group in battle. And it's been impressive. But 300 against, you know, thousands, hundreds, a thousand soldiers, uh, that's... That has to be God. There, no one can say, well, they were just really good fighters. All right, so Gideon uh, now has them. They all have their trumpets uh, and provisions. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you were afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura, and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. So this is telling us more about Gideon, right? Because what does God say? I'll give you another sign. I'll give you another sign, right? You know, I know, I know how much you love signs, Gideon. If you're still afraid, go down 
And what does Gideon do? He goes down right away, right? He, he shows that he's still afraid. I'm, I'm definitely in the Gideon camp of, of fearful, so I can't throw stones. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels could, be, could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given... God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. All right, so what is, what is God doing? How has God already started the battle? Putting fear. In the Putting fear. He gives them dreams, right? We just talked about the other day, uh, the notion of dreams and how God uh, works through dreams and speaks to people through dreams. God is speaking through dreams to the camp. Uh, all throughout the world, uh, people have always believed dreams were uh, a sign of the divine. And so the Midianites, they didn't clear out house of all the guys who are afraid, right? All the guys who are still afraid on their side, they're all there and they got big mouths and they're talking about how not only are they afraid and they know Gideon's name, uh, they, they basically, they know his father's name, they're so scared of him. Uh, and they obviously don't have any clue. Uh, now, this is speculative, uh, and I, I shouldn't say it. I wouldn't say it if it was a sermon, but I'll say it in Bible study. I think the Midianites saw the 22,000 leave, and I think they probably thought, whoa, they have so many soldiers that they can send away 22,000? Like, oh, man, they've, gotten, they've got so many guys hit over there that they, they've said to these 22,000, oh, man, yeah, we don't even need you guys. You guys can go home. We have enough soldiers to beat them. Right? I mean, that has to mess with their, their heads uh, to see all these troops moving in this way. Um, I can't say that for certain. That's just my, my speculation. Uh, but in any case, God is working. He's giving uh, dreams to these guys so that they're afraid. Verse 15, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. All right, so what is he doing? Um, he's making every guy the standard bearer. He's making every guy the bugle uh, boy, as it were. Normally in an army, you would have that spread out throughout you know, a certain group, right? So you might have 100 soldiers or 1,000 soldiers, and you'd have a trumpet here or a guy... Uh, here with the torch. And so what he's doing is he's only sending out, you know, those guys. He's only sending it out so that it looks like every single one of them is, you know, the, the kind of uh, scary sign of lots and lots of soldiers to come. Uh, so it's, it makes sense strategically what he's doing too. Verse 17, watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had charged, uh, they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other uh, with, their own, with their swords, the army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zerath, uh, toward Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mahaloa, Mahaloa near Tabath. 
Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Mayanites. All right, so basically what happens in this battle? They make a lot of sound. They make a lot of light. They shout out that victory is theirs. Uh, and, and what exactly the sound means, again, debated. Was it that some suggest they had their torches like inside pots somehow while still lit? And then when they smashed them, it was like all of a sudden the lights were on all around them and they felt surrounded, like they'd been snuck up on in the middle of the night. Um, is that what they were doing? I don't know. Were they smashing the pottery to make it sound like the camps were already getting you know, ransacked and tossed over and that all these guys were dying in their sleep? I don't know. But whatever it was, it worked because all of them start to flee. And as they flee, what had looked like a strength before, because remember the Midianites were there with the Amalekites and with all these different people who didn't recognize each other, what had looked like a strength before, now in the middle of the night, that's a liability, right? All these foreigners look the same to me, right? And so they start killing each other uh, because they don't know who you know Gideon is or, or where his soldiers are. And so they just hear the noise, they start fleeing, and they start killing each other in the middle of the battle. And then when they're fleeing from their position, right, they, they initially had a spot in the valley where their numbers were going to help them. They're going to be organized and ready for battle. Uh, this is where you fought battles in Israel. Um, and now they're on the run, right? Now they're in a tactically much worse position than they were in. And now Gideon goes out to all those guys who were too scared to fight. And says, look, they're already running. And then they come and join in the fight, right? It's, it's one thing to stand against a well-organized army and to have the courage to fight. It's another thing to chase after a group that's already split and that already has this losing spirit to them, right? Um, that's sort of the idea. And so all these people get summoned back to battle. All those tribes, again, Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh, all the ones who had been there before, they all come back. Uh, and fight. Uh, verse 24, Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they took the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. All right, uh, end of chapter seven. So not only do all the soldiers come back and fight and rout the Midianites, but they also get their leaders. They also get uh, these two head honchos, uh, kind of these uh, these figures, Oreb and Zeb, uh, and they have you know public executions for them to to basically show their strength, to show the fact that God had given them victory with three hundred soldiers initially, uh, and so they're able to secure all of the land. Uh, and it keeps making this mention of to the Jordan, to the Jordan. If you remember at the beginning of the book of Joshua, when they're going into the Promised Land, they have to go across the Jordan because that's the Canaanite territory. So the Jordan is like the boundary of Israel and they go across and now they've fought all the way back to the Jordan. So they've taken a lot of good territory back. They've gotten a lot of good land. They've made some real serious headway. Uh, and it's mentioning uh, that they're taking the springs and the waters. And if we remember last time when Deborah was singing her song, she was singing about how people had to be afraid when they would go out to get water because the enemies you know, would shoot their arrows. They would take control of that area. And now they have the waters. Now they're established. Now they're set up for success. Uh, and so God has, has given this great victory. Uh, and they didn't even have to like fight initially. Uh, it was just sound. Uh, and I think there's something to that. Um, as, as Lutherans, we always emphasize that God reaches his people through word and sacrament. And God speaks faith into us uh, by the word. Even when you uh, talk about, you know, what is a sacrament in the, the catechism. It says uh, it's, it's the word added to the thing. Uh, when God creates the world, he creates it by speaking his word. Uh, there is something to sound uh, that God chooses with humans. Uh, maybe it's because you can't 
see it um, in a visible way. And so the, the very sense requires faith in that, that way. Uh, but there's something about sound. There's something about the way that God speaks and God declares his victory. Uh, and I, I think it's very important that right before they got victory, they declared a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, right? Um, the idea is that when God says he's going to give his people victory, it's because he's attached his name to them, right? If they fail right after shouting victory for the Lord, God fails in that sense, right? Um, and this is why we should be so comforted as Christians that we have been baptized into God's name. Because wherever we go, his name is printed on us, right? You know, property of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, God has a very vested interest in what happens to you because he has brought you into his family. He has named you with his name. Uh, and so God blesses you and protects you and goes with you even when uh, you're afraid, even when, like Gideon, you're asking for a sign or you're not sure um, of how you're going to do it. And so this is the comfort that God goes with his people, that he attaches himself to his name and to his promises, uh, and he's faithful to his word. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Well, with that the case, why don't we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the victory that you gave to your people. Thank you that you are enough for us to face any challenge and difficulty in life. Thank you for going with us every step of the journey and filling us with the Holy Spirit as you did Gideon. Help us to always trust in you and not be dominated by our fears or worries. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.